Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining me for the next hour uh, to talk about a topic um, we, Uber Freight and I, Lior, are uh, very passionate about, uh, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm Lior Ron, founder and CEO of Uber Freight. Uh, thank you for taking an hour away from your time, from your busy schedule to learn a bit more uh, on a very important uh, topic um, and just uh, appreciate uh, your time and engagement. Uh, I'm um, been a student uh, of AI for the past uh, 20 years and uh, I have seen the topic and the field uh, grow from its uh, infancy. I had a pleasure of actually being a student for AI uh, doing my master thesis in the Technion on artificial intelligence, had the pleasure of being part of the amazing Google Maps team at Google, where we've used artificial intelligence to map uh, the world 15 years ago. Uh, and then throughout many uh, stops in my career, I've witnessed uh, the impact and potential artificial intelligence have uh, on uh, all of us. And uh, what I want to spend the next hour is talking with you about uh, AI in our favorite topic here, which is logistics. Uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, what is artificial intelligence and deep learning to just demystify a bit and just explain what is going on. Uh, and then uh, talk about the potential impact uh, for logistics, uh, specifically some of the things that uh, we are doing, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, all of your questions. Um, so excited uh, to get going. And really the premise and what uh, I think probably the reason that uh, you've all joined uh, is what we see around us in society and the fact that AI is changing everything around us. It is prevalent um, and uh, deep and changing almost everything we know in society. I'm sure you have many examples. I'll just count few from just the last few months. Uh, GPT-4 passing the bar exam uh, with resounding success, better than uh, most, uh, if not almost all human students, uh, gen generative AI, helping track and predict health conditions and actually intervene and suggest treatments for folks in a, a, a variety of health conditions. A generative AI being a co-pilot for engineers, basically doubling the productivity and the amount and the quality of the code they can generate, leading to basically a redefinition almost of what does it mean to be a programmer globally. Um, my wife is actually a biology researcher and overnight, the field of biology research has completely been transformed with generative AI now basically being able to do uh, what was in the realm of very few biology researchers before, which is the ability to pr predict and build the structure of proteins and solve every structure of protein known uh, in uh, biology systems, all the way to generative AI actually being um, an artist and winning various art and uh, photography competitions as predicated just in the last uh, Sony World Photography Awards. So uh, this is definitely all around us and the rate of change is faster than ever before. Uh, this shows you some of the adoption curve of some of the basic technologies that we have all witnessed as society over the past few decades and how uh, fast it took uh, technologies to arrive to, uh, let's say, a billion users globally. And uh, generative AI, since the launch of ChatGPT, over the last two years has basically amassed to over a hundred million users or even more, uh, uh, 10 to a hundred X faster than mobile technology, than internet adoption to uh, every other technology that was adopted uh, in, in history of humankind. And the rate of the change, meaning that the access, the implications, uh, the opportunity 
uh, will grow faster than anything else we know before. And uh, this is why it's even more important to just be aware of what's going on and understand the opportunities and what does it mean for us in logistics, uh, for you in your companies, and how to best sort of uh, uh, um, utilize this technology uh, for the greater good. Now, uh, with this overnight adoption uh, to get here was a very long road that uh, I think we all saw various facets and stops on the way of getting the, to this moment from uh, the first uh, robotic explorations, like a Roomba taking our houses in store by storm 20 years ago to NASA using uh, very early neural networks um, to land rovers on Mars and to the moon to the event of uh, ImageNet in 2006 and the significance of those discoveries, whether it's ImageNet uh, or the Google search engine, was the realization that uh, it's not just the algorithm, it's the amount of data that you expose those algorithms to, to best identify a cat in an internet video, it's not just about the algorithm to identify the cat, it's about feeding the algorithm millions of photos of cats to be able to actually understand uh, what does it mean uh, to see a cat. That was really the implication of the 2006, late 2000 sort of adoption of big data. And then we saw some of the innovations that following that, whether it's Watson uh, winning Jeopardy in 2011, or the advent of self-driving cars by Waymo. We'll get to that uh, later on and what does that mean uh, for logistics or variety of like aha moment, like um, a, a deep mind winning AlphaGo um, and um, winning the Go World Championship in 2016. Um, and then really coming into the concept of deep learning and large language models that culminated into the chat GPT launch in 2022. So this was a, a long um, road in the making, and maybe it's important to just spend a handful of minutes just understanding what it is and what does it mean, all those buzzwords and uh, uh, different types of artificial intelligence. So uh, artificial intelligence in its essence, it's about teaching machines how to uh, process and data and think and generate um, recommendations and generating sort of a, a new data output and basically helping machine learn uh, using data. And uh, in the school of artificial intelligence, uh, we have machine learning that is more sort of the simplistic type of learning and then deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning that is sort of given rise to now large language models and uh, chat GPT. Let's talk a bit uh, about machine learning, which was the initial sort of days uh, of learning. Machine learns, learnings are a very simple learning activity where we teach the machine how to understand data by providing the machine answers and examples of answers of what for those questions that we're trying to teach the machine. So in my example of uh, the cat videos, we will feed into the machine a million different photos and say those 10,000 are cats and those 990,000 are not cats. So it involved the act of labeling data, providing uh, the answer, and it's usually done for relatively like narrow use cases like identifying license plates or detecting spam or doing some statistical inference. And to be able to do that simplistic learning, which is statistical model or decision trees, you need to feed the labeling data, which is the biggest impediment uh, for scaling uh, those uh, techniques. But what machine learning gave the rise to is to advent of deep learning. And what's unique about deep learning is you can do that learning without providing the labeling data and without providing the answer. So you can unleash a deep learning model on the internet and the model by itself 
will actually learn from the data by finding connections between the data and will actually sort of build the hierarchical structure of the domain it's learning, let's say the internet, uh, basically self-informed, and that will allow you to basically unleash learning in a much better scale. And because you don't have to do the manual labeling uh, as part of that, you can actually learn much faster and much deeper uh, in a totally sort of a, a different uh, scale. So that's what really deep learning added to the equation in a, a sort of the, the next step for that was really building inference model. So in this example, we've unleashed our deep learning um, model on the internet, and we've actually learned the connotation between all the different sentences and web pages and how words are grouped and what comes first and what comes second and how many vowels are in every sentence and how to actually sort of like a, 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 a what fall uh, under grammatically correct versus incorrect, what's more prevalent, what's not. And we've been able to basically build a deep model with hierarchy, with structure of the English or any language. And what it allows us to do now sort of a, doing large language model, which is a subset of deep learning is the ability to predict what's the next word gonna be in this model, uh, because we've looked at a, a million different instantiations of that sentence and similar sentences like that, and basically predict that the next word is home and be able to actually uh, uh, predict uh, um, sequencing of words, languages, and understand really concepts. So that's the what large language models brought to the table, machine learning, deep learning, unsupervised, and now, with large language models, basically be able to construct hierarchy and relationship between a, a, all the text ever sort of known to humankind and being able to then essentially understand natural language and be able to interact with us uh, in a very free form way. So that uh, gave rise to uh, the concept of LLM or a chat GBT and uh, uh, usually those models are now being built in two phases. One, you generate the base model. So a GPT-4 will be the base model of a, a language built on all the internet and a, a host of other data sources. And you'll condense that model that holds all the relationship and all the knowledge and all the understanding of language together. And then to that generic model, you'll basically feed a more refined, more narrow model on a specific domain. So you'll feed a sort of voice model and then you'll be able to actually have a chat GPT or you'll feed an image model on top of that and then you'll be able to have image generation or you will feed a medical a vocabulary on top of that and then you'll be able to actually a, a converse in diseases and health conditions. Or in our examples, you will feed a logistics model to the generic model to really allow the large language model to better understand logistics and the relationship between everything in logistics and the specific domain, again, in our example, would be logistics. So two phases, generic models, and then domain-specific models, all of those bots and all of those vertical use cases that are rising now, are basically vertical apps. Think about it like apps in your app store. Vertical models built on a, basically an operating system that understand semant semantics, understand human language, understand the connections between everything. Okay? So that's a bit um, of a premiere. Now, in the end of the day, we need two things uh, for magic to happen. We need data, uh, and we need intense computing resources to make sense of all of the data. And in the end of the day, the biggest breakthrough over the last couple of years have actually been the ability to dedicate so much computing resources for large language models to truly scale. And it kind of makes sense if you if you zoom out on sort of what's happening, the human brain, the uh, uh, box here that allows me to do this webinar and talk with you, 
has about 86 billion neurons uh, or, or, or small sort of transformers that allow us to do input and output and generate uh, action. Well, the latest GPT-4 computing models has almost two trillion parameters. So that's like more than 10, 20 X more uh, uh, cells or computing nodes than a human brain. So it makes sense that if you ex if you expose a machine to much more data that, that we have ever been exposed to, and you give that machine 20x more thinking power and brain power than we ever have access to, then some interesting stuff will happen as a result. And that's why we keep we'll keep seeing more and more advance in la large language model in the years to come because the compute power is gonna continue to scale uh, uh, very fast and the access to data is going to continue to scale very fast. So in many models, uh, the machines are already beyond human levels and we're just going to see that continue to rise as both compute and data uh, will rise over the next uh, couple of years. Which brings us to our topic of the day and the premise that with that explosion of data and that explosion of compute and that explosion of opportunities, we will see in our lifetime and very soon AI completely revolutionizing logistics. And if you think about that, it kind of makes sense. As we all know, logistics is a big global optimization challenge where we as supply chain professionals are trying to make sense of all of the constraints, complexities, data, and trying to optimize in the end of the day, service, cost, operational constraints, and sort of like resolve that equation in the most optimal way. In the end of the day, machines can do that more effectively, more efficiently, and solve that global constraint and optimization problem better than us, better than humans, and the opportunity lies in really allowing to unleash that power of big data processing to allow us to inform better decision making, better supply chain optimization, better outcome for what we're trying to do uh, day to day. Um, so we fundamentally believe uh, in Uber Freight that AI will transform logistics. And that's what we have been building towards for the past couple of years. And I'll be excited to just share some of the examples that we have been working on uh, uh, over those years, because uh, we all know how big of an opportunity and how big of a challenge is global logistics uh, with the huge uh, uh, role it's playing in society and the huge inefficiencies whether it's the empty miles, the cost uh, issues, and, and all the waste in the system that we all as supply chain professionals are dealing with day in and day out. So uh, uh, I wanna uh, move to the second section of uh, this webinar, which is more about uh, the steps to get to that AI future and, and some of the uh, uh, preconditions that allow us to do that, uh, to do that and what are some of the ways that we see logistics in a, a transformed by AI in what we're doing and others are doing, whether it's Uber Freight uh, or other players uh, as well. So to begin with, I would say there's like four, maybe four, to simplify this, like four categories of transformation that we see. Uh, digitization, which is basically the precondition for everything to do any better inference, to do any better decision, things need to be digitized. Then you want to automate that and connect all the dots. Then we'll talk about machine learning, which is the simplistic way of actually learning once you have digitized stuff. And then the next frontier, generative AI, and we'll talk about some of the uh, latest and greatest examples um, in, that, uh, in that domain. So uh, I'll start from uh, digitization. And really the, the inspiration for me personally on the journey, and one of the reasons I uh, started Uber Freight seven years ago was my my humble experience being part of the Google Maps team 
and actually having the uh, honor and the privilege of leading Google Maps. And the vision we had Google Maps 15 years ago was let, let's take a physical universe. We all remember paper maps 20 years ago and transform that to a digital universe with the aid of technology. And we've been, I've been part of the journey when I joined Google Maps. It was like two countries on a map, US and UK and a blue ocean. We didn't know anything about any other country. We didn't know street level uh, um, data. We didn't know anything about uh, driving directions. And I had a pleasure over uh, uh, the course of 10 years, growing that from like 10 million users to over a billion users and fully digitizing a physical world reality into what we know now into what sort of we know and love. So this is the the, the uh, physical uh, example of that and transforming that over 10 years to what we know and love now, which is Google Maps and a fully accurate digital representation of everything around us. And once things are digitized and once things are connected, then magic can happen on top because now you can sort of unleash machines and technology versus having to go manually, um, which just doesn't allow you to create sort of the, the, the next uh, frontier of use cases. And when we created Google Maps, we never imagined that a company named Uber will be built on top of that because we have now the underlying mapping infrastructure of a physical world transformed globally to a digital first infrastructure. It's that same thinking we bought seven years ago to Uber Freight, really asking ourselves, how can we take a phys the physical first world of logistics and digitize that so we can have the most accurate digital twin representation of supply chain globally? And that has been the vision and our sort of push for the past seven years around basically uh, creating that um, since uh, the very early days of uh, essentially taking that um, sort of digital first universe and mapping that uh, all together. So um, we'll see if that uh, goes or not. So here we go. So I think... Uh, Okay, we'll transition uh, to the next uh, slide here. So we really wanted to um, take that physical reality and create a digital first uh, universe. And we actually came along uh, very far uh, into that. Uh, we've created a, a virtual apparatus that now has uh, $18 billion of freight under management um, that gives us the data and the digitization that we need uh, for the rest of the journey almost 100,000 carriers, uh, over uh, almost 10,000 shippers, uh, 2 million truck drivers that have now been onboarded to the Uber Freight platform. That's more than half of all truck drivers uh, in the US and just uh, tens of millions of uh, transactions that we process annually. And that allows us to actually have uh, uh, the full digital infrastructure to then, then take the next step on the digital journey. And the next step for us uh, is really moving from, once you actually sort of build that digital infrastructure, really sort of move to uh, automating that. And we've made substantial uh, progress on automating uh, all of that as well. Today on Uber Freight, more than 85%, almost 90% of all the loads are booked automatically without any human touch. The vast majority of them are tracked automatically without any human touch. All the invoicing, the tension, everything on the back end is being done automatically with you, without any human touch. Even most of the schedule and the appointment now with uh, the docks and facilities is now being done automatically. And uh, we can only do that with a digital infrastructure. And once we have that, then magic happens. Uh, for example, that will be. Um, that will be um, basically the ability to actually uh, serve uh, serve uh, much better and uh, basically sort of serve a service outcome uh, much better than 
uh, what's common in industry because we have uh, all the uh, things connected and we actually have the ability uh, uh, to do that at scale. So you digitize first, you automate second, and the third phase is let's actually start doing some learnings uh, on top of that. And the more uh, straightforward learning will be uh, machine learning. So I want to just uh, show you a few examples at Uber Freight of us uh, using machine learning for a variety of uh, different uh, use cases and application. Uh, I'll start by actually talking about uh, pricing, which is uh, one of the uh, more interesting uh, applications of machine learning. Uh, our corporate parent Uber has really excelled in understanding pricing at a very granular level globally in every city using very sophisticated pricing algorithm. And we have taken some of those fundamentals and applied them to freight and logistics, where we have a very sophisticated base pricing model that can essentially predict what's the price of every truck on every lane in every geography in the United States. And on top of that, applying sort of a temporal search pricing that is learning from the environment, from the weather, from the daily and the sort of like a, almost second by second fluctuations of the marketplace to be able to, we believe, predict the price of a truckload in the US more accurately than anything that has existed before. And that is using extremely sophisticated machine learning models that is looking in hundreds, if not thousands of different parameters from the a market balance to the location history of a specific driver to uh, uh, the preference and the load history and allows to not only predict what will be the price for that load, but also predict who are the best drivers to book a specific load and allows us basically with machine learning to rank like the search results you're seeing on your uh, uh, Google search results to rank all the different load recommendations to a specific truck driver at scale based on their preferences, based on their history, based on their geography, based on their uh, previous loads that they've booked, based on everything we understand about the truck driver. And essentially both of those are machine learning optimization problem at scale. How to predict the best price for a load and then how to actually match that with the best truck driver or the best carrier for that load. So uh, uh, those will be two uh, uh, of the more prominent examples and that allowed us to basically drive year over year between the ability to predict price and the ability to clear loads from the marketplace more and more and more efficient uh, uh, service and efficient cost for truck load in the US where we believe we are now one of the a cost leaders in the market when it comes to actually sort of a, a booking and finding a capacity at scale a, over 2 million truck drivers. Now, so one component of that is the lane topology and the pricing. The other component of that, as we all know, in logistics is facilities. And similar to Google Maps, we have an opportunity here with machine learning to actually map the logistics world. And those are two examples of machine learning that we apply in the Uber Freight business today. On the top, the green dots, uh, you basically see us learning from the breadcrumbs of the GPS of all those 2 million truck drivers, understanding exactly the topology of a facility. Where are they going? What are the doors? What is the a, 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 a geographic boundary of that facility. Where do we have congestion? Where do we not? What's the average idle time? What is the fluctuation on that idle time over time? Basically allowing us to truly understand the behavior of a facility over time. The chart on the, the, the bottom, the yellow one, is the ability for us to use that to automatically generate the geofence on a facility and then automatically understand if a truck driver has checked in to the facility or checked out, basically inferring that from uh, all of those uh, data nodes. And the combination of both of those and the pricing uh, machine learning allows us to really understand back to uh, uh, supply chain optimization the trade-off between location and facilities and pricing 
so we can actually offer shippers choices and allow it uh, allow you to understand the relationship between what does it actually mean to be a shipper of choice and what are the various conditions and facilities are correlated with different prices uh, that you're getting for transportation in and out of those facilities so you can continue to improve the conditions in facilities and reduce the overall transportation costs for drivers coming in and out of your facilities. So another example of a, a machine learning. The, the last example of machine learning I, I gave is uh, one of the biggest challenges facing us as society, um, as we all know, which is really uh, emissions and the unsustainable future of an industry that is running 30%, 35% uh, empty on average with billions and billions of truck driving hours that are going to the wayside. And we think there's a real opportunity to do something about minimizing those empty miles using machine learning. So what we do, something we call bundles, is we basically look, if you look at the map, we look at all load permutations in real time coming to our $18 billion network and basically combining those loads in something we call a bundle. There's basically a head hole and a back hole or in some cases a freeway route or a four-way route from LA to Phoenix to Dallas and then back to really allow us to minimize the empty miles on the network and then we can present those bundles to truck drivers so they can minimize the empty miles on their assets and actually earn more money by actually driving full, not empty. In the process, create a win for them because they can uh, be paid more and not drive empty, a win for shippers because they can clear those loads actually in a more sustainable price because they're getting the benefit uh, of not uh, uh, going back empty and a huge win for the environment as well. Now, think about the machine learning complexity it takes to do that. You need to understand every load coming into the system in real time. You need to construct bundles of that load with every other load around that. You need to present it in real time to the truck driver. And if somebody has booked one of those legs, you basically need in real time to collapse the option because that load is now out of the system and only show the remaining options in real time on the marketplace for drivers uh, uh, to book. So lots of computational intensity, lots of sort of real time uh, machine learning and uh, we're very pleased with the results. Uh, we've been able to eliminate almost a quarter of the empty miles on the Uber Freight network. We now offer three quarters of all the loads that we have on the marketplace as bundles and huge gain for the uh, environment and we just getting going of that concept of continuous moves and eliminating every shred of empty mile who can in the network. And the only way you can do that, it's very hard to do that manually with people. The only way you can do that is digitize, automate, and then learn at scale on the network. All right, so uh, those are a couple of examples of machine learning. Uh, let's get to the fun stuff, which is uh, uh, Gen AI, generative AI, and the opportunities that uh, that um, presents to the market. We spoke about what generative AI is. We see a prevalence of use cases and applications of generative AI in logistics across uh, everything. Those are just a few examples that we see from some of our favorite startups using Gen AI to identify warehouse conditions and being able to actually fully understand what's happening within the four walls of a warehouse to offering sort of a industrial robot platform at scale with very complicated manipulations that have not been able actually to be done before without the use of those very complicated models to understand uh, the world around us all the way to NLP and invoice processing that allow uh, us to automate uh, back office processing and uh, invoicing at scale. Uh, one of the interesting um, applications we see for generative AI uh, is in the realm of self-driving. And one of the uh, companies that we have been partnering with is a company called Wabi that is really putting a generative AI first approach in everything it's doing. And what you see here is the same way that uh, a chat GPT can generate text 
or images, ChatGPT or GenTV, I can now generate sim fully simulated worlds where you can see on the right, you see basically, um, you can see basically a, um, a, a, a picture without all the objects and on the left, you basically see the same picture with fully virtually generated objects that have been added to that scene. What you see here is basically 16 different permutation of the same scene. Again, on the right, what it looks without, the original scene on the left, fully simulated object that looks like a real object. So then the self-driving machine can learn that virtual driver can learn in simulation based on every permutation of uh, traffic and emergency and construction zones and even weather can be added to that. And all of that learning can happen in a virtual simulator versus on the road. And then once you actually introduce the driver to uh, the world, you're getting a far superior uh, uh, results as we can see uh, here, uh, of basically you take all of that learning in the simulator with all of those billions of different combinations of traffic. And then once you actually sort of like uh, uh, bring the driver to uh, the physical road, you're getting superior self-driving uh, results because of all of that learning that happened uh, in the simulator. Uh, so uh, that's not just a concept, it's actually a reality. Uh, we are partnering with Wabi and a host of other self-driving companies, uh, Volvo and Aurora, that are doing some great uh, job in that domain as well, uh, to create essentially the most scaled network of self-driving truck and logistics deployment, where we, are, as we speak, are now moving dozens of loads a week in the corridors between Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and in the process of basically scaling that this year, throughout Texas and into other regions like El Paso, New Mexico, Arizona, and essentially being ready for a full autonomous deployment uh, over the next two years. Again, not enabled without gener generative AI at the core of the development. I want to maybe end uh, with a, a, the last example, which is the most exciting one for us as we have really thought about how can we tailor and leverage generative AI to really unleash the power of AI and machine learning to you, to supply chain professionals. And how can we build on all the vast data we have in our system to be able to take all of those parameters, all of that data, everything that we have actually built uh, and learn all of that, allow the machine to learn all of that, to power decision-making that you are trying to do and explorations that you are trying to do on your supply chain. And what we've done is basically we've sort of like looked at all the near $20 billion of freight under management we manage, the billion, of different data points that we manage, that virtual world that we have constructed, the facilities, the lanes, the drivers, the prices, the trade-offs, the uh, service levels, the routing guides, everything that we have, and we basically sort of fed it to the machine. We now have in that model, you can call it our logistics large language model. We have over a billion data points. We'll have over 2 billion data points in the next four weeks. And we constructed that together to launch something we called Insights AI, which is the ability for you to query your data and ask anything you want to aid and to equip you to perform better supply chain uh, decisions. So this is an example that we have launched a few months ago. And in this video, you see that I'm just, you can ask uh, us uh, or the Insights AI chatbot, hey, where is my worst service in my operation? And you'll instantly get sort of that uh, uh, result. Those are the worst uh, service lanes in your operation. And then you're like, okay, Bloomingtail looks pretty bad, only 51% uh, service. Uh, who is that actually impacting? Who are the customers 
that uh, Bloomingdale is actually impacting and then seeing the uh, uh, distribution of that. And then you kind of want to ask free form questions. Hey, what's actually driving service failures on those loads? That's what you usually ask your team of analysts. In this example, you see basically the machine doing a statistical exploration of every parameter in the system to automatically infer that actually what's causing the service failure on those loads is a specific carrier SCAR code because statistically, that's what's showing the most correlation between that. That's the parameter showing the most correlation with that and service levels. Then we all want to actually know what our peers are doing. So you can also ask various benchmarking questions like, hey, what other CPG customers uh, or, or CPG benchmark and peers are doing um, compared to me? And you can see that um, you are sort of, a, 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 your rate per mile is actually lower than CPG peers. So you can feel a bit good about yourself. Um, and then you can ask more and more and more explore accessorial, detention calls, the distribution uh, of that. You can click into any one of those parameters and really what's unifying to all of those examples, the ability to free form, explore your supply chain, get instant answers on anything you want to know with any data source you want to know and uh, using sort of Steve Jobs' uh, phrase, it's like bicycle for your mind because the analysis and exploration that takes weeks, if not months, can now be done instantly. We are still the supply chain professionals in control. We are the one asking the questions, but now we have the machine to do all the heavy lift behind the scenes and allow us to get instant access to all the information in our supply chain, in our organization, to be able to explore, to uh, um, be more efficient with our time, to supercharge the time that we spend, trying to get those answers, to accelerate and improve the decision-making that we're trying to do as supply chain professionals. And at the end of the day, the goal here is optimizing our supply chain. And what you'll see in, in, in what we have launched, it's not just the data exploration, it's also starting to actually make proactive recommendations on how to optimize things. Understanding this is a non-performing carrier on those lanes and actually sort of understand that intuitively and then suggest proactive things to do about that. That's sort of the next frontier. Or understanding like a routing guide strategy, understanding sort of what's off on that compared to 500 other peers and suggest ways to actually repair that routing guide in real time based on market. And that's where uh, uh, the magic will start sort of showing it's even more, not only giving you the ultimate tool to query everything, but giving you the tool to actually have proactive recommendation of what to do about that and how to actually drive results on that. Uh, we call it Insights AI. We've launched it uh, for those of you who have been with us at Deliver, our biggest shipper conference uh, two months ago. Uh, we've opened that to better customers and we have seen overwhelming demand uh, to uh, be uh, experimenting and uh, using the tool. Uh, we have doubled the team. Uh, since uh, the launch a few weeks ago, and we are sort of overwhelmed with cheaper interest. We're trying to uh, uh, go through uh, all the early adopters and sort of like support them and their needs as we basically sort of allow them to refine that to the specific context of their organization and their supply chain. And we are super excited about the roadmap here and what to come. And um, we're also inviting you to participate in that journey with us as well. I'll share some details on that in a second. So that's a bit of the latest and greatest on Gen AI on our side. We see uh, generative AI not only transforming your work and your job uh, over time and really allowing you to focus on the more strategic insights while the machine is doing a lot of the mundane sort of day-to-day -day analysis, but also allowing machine learning to transform everything in the operation from the operation itself and service. We use today generative AI to do everything from ranking all the service exceptions that our team should be handling. So we can actually sort of address the most pressing thing first based on a very 
sort of a, a nuanced parameters and prioritization to actually equip our support agents with all the information at their fingertips so they can sort of resolve and uh, provide you the answer with a human answer, but with a b automated backend as soon as possible. It transforms ours and others, customer service as well. We see higher efficiency, quicker resolution time, higher NPS and customer satisfaction and be able to actually answer those uh, uh, questions faster with the use of AI. And we see AI transforming how we code and how we develop things by actually uh, 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 seeing material productivity uh, increase in uh, coding as the machine suggests our engineers of what to code and how to code and basically code the code together with the engineers. We see almost a 30% productivity increase once, once, once our engineering team is working with an AI as a co-coder or co-pilot. So those are some of the examples. I wanted to uh, finish this up by just talking about some best practices for your organization and how to take this home as you think about AI in your company and how can you really leverage that energy and that momentum and that op opportunity to explore how can it better your organization, whether it's logistics or just your general uh, company. You know, that's a a Cisco study that shows that 95% of organizations want to have a plan around generative, generative AI. The, the sad reality is only 14% of them are in any shape or form of uh, being ready to implement. So if you're still in the beginning of your journey, you're not alone. And uh, there's definitely a lot of untapped opportunity. Here's just a couple of thoughts and best practices we have done to really transform Uber Freight to be an AI first company that is really leveraging AI to transform everything that we do across the stack. First is education. That's what we just done. I encourage you to be educated. You signing for this webinar is already a sign that you're doing that. There's tons of resources and taking the time to educate the entire company or the entire set of stakeholder is beneficial. We've actually sort of like offered machine learning education to the entire company, including the non-engineers. We offer them access to those resources. We do internal webinars, really like educating what's going on and like what to like start people thinking about the opportunities. Once you educate, you want to really find your change agents. Who is going to be a change agent that will be able to actually take this from zero to one? Who can advocate? for implementing AI in the workforce, who can actually understand some of those changes a bit more uh, intimately and who can be a partner uh, to do the hardest step, which is taking things from zero to one, to overcome the initial challenges, to overcome the initial detractors, really identifying the group of change engines and staying close to them and creating a peer group of AI enthusiastic in the organization is key. That's what we've done. We basically have a AI a, a transformation a, a agent or a peer in almost every one of the working groups we have or every one of the functions we have to allow a faster change management. Then you really want to get buy-in. You want to have a balanced team of um, you want to have a balanced team of um, operation and product people. And you want to mix them together so they're diverse and they can feed of each other and you can really sort of explore the opportunities. Uh, all of those opportunities that we've created came from a tiger team that had engineers, but also had logistics experts and some of the amazing expertise we have in-house to partner and allow us to actually create those solutions. And then you want to experiment. You really want to have a lot of seeds. Sometimes it's hard to know what's going to work and what's not. You want a fast experiment, try a bunch of ideas, see what sticks and really lower the friction to just try things internally until you see what clicks and what you can scale. Um, and you want to do all of that in a both top-down approach where uh, uh, me as an example are giving some guidance to, to the organization on what to focus on, but also at a bottom-up approach where you encourage your teams to experiment 
in the end of the day, the combination of top down and bottom up, that's what produced the results and the impact. We basically had an internal hackathon at Uber Freight where we've asked the entire team to hack together for a full two days ideas around using gen generative AI at Uber Freight. Uh, to do that, we've educated, we identified the change engines, we got buying, we've constructed those teams, and we allowed them to experiment for two days. We had like over 35 different teams and different ideas. And one of those ideas is what you now see launch as a mature product inside AI, but it started with an experimentation with the ability to actually give some space to understand what actually works, what not, and from that, identify and then sort of push those opportunities. So that's just a bit of a framework and hopefully uh, that can be helpful about uh, the road ahead. And we are very excited about the road ahead. We really see uh, our mission as powering intelligent logistics, powering your logistics, your supply chain with intelligence. We think machine learning, deep learning, large language models, is playing a huge part in that. If you are a supply chain professional and a shipper or customer, we want to invite you to see and test yourself the latest from us with Insights AI. That's the webpage. And we are now accepting signups and we are sort of ready to uh, support people on their journey to adopt AI in the supply chain. Uh, if you have a sales um, a, a person or a partner for Uber Freight uh, that you know, you can also reach out to them or you can sign up for that webpage. And we are here to support you in all of your needs, not just the super fancy insights AI, but also how to adopt your organization for an AI future, how to share the best practices that we have seen and anything we can do to really allow you to be competitive because the reality and I know that's one of the reasons that everybody's here. If you don't adopt and stay on the adoption curve and on the cutting edge, then you'll be cut. Like it's a very competitive uh, landscape and companies that will figure out how to leverage AI to accelerate their business objectives will succeed. Uh, so we are here to support you on that. Thank you for taking the time. And we have a few minutes uh, left. So um, I'm going to, Turn now uh, for Q&A. You can use the uh, Zoom Q&A function to type uh, any question you want to discuss. Uh, we'll open this up for uh, questions. Um, so feel free to just type any questions uh, you want into the chat box. Uh, and uh, I'll also um, take the opportunity to answer some of the questions that you have submitted before. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll say that uh, everything here was recorded. We'll offer this as a webinar. If you want to show this content to other people in the organization, you'll have the ability to do that. That's one of the questions that I see here. Let's take some uh, live questions. Um, uh, Jason is asking, what's the risks and watchouts of AI? I would say, Jason, it's really about, it's a tool. AI is a tool, like any other tool in our life. So as a tool, it's really identifying what is this tool good for and what is it not good for and not jumping uh, uh, prematurely. Uh, so in the initial implementation of the tool is to support decision-making. We, you, Jason, me, are in the driver's seat. We are making decisions. We are optimizing our supply chain. AI is in the backdrop, helping us, giving recommendations, giving data, but it's a it's a co-pilot. We are the pilot. It's a co-pilot. The risk is, one of the risks, you move it to a decision a, a, a position prematurely and, uh, you know, you'll get 80-90% of the time right, but 5-10% wrong, and that will lead to not bad outcomes, so, uh, to bad outcomes. So it's really about identifying where it works and being on the curve of using it in the appropriate places. The other risk, watch out, and that was also some of the other questions that you guys asked, is a precondition for success, remember the steps, is data and the cleanness of data and the quality of data. You, you all know that. We've all done that endless times in our day job. Garbage in, garbage out. If the data is not clean, then no matter how AI will be on top of that, you'll still get bad outcome. So as we all go in our journey, in our organizations on cleaning the data, on integrating, on 
on preparing the supply chain for that era, the quality of data and integration is paramount. We do that with our managed transportation business where we go in detail on how to allow you to clean your data, to integrate it, to organize your data. When we do a full TM implementation, it's after like nine months of our integration team helping you really organize your data. So then we can actually leverage that to all of this goodness in a very straightforward way. But also if you're not a TM customer, there's a lot of best practices and I encourage everyone to invest in the infrastructure, whether it's the data, the ERP, the TMS connectivity that allows one to be able to actually uh, do all of that. Um, okay, let's um, let's uh, uh, get some other questions as well. I think lots of questions here on what's the future of Insights AI. So um, I think a, a super exciting start. Here's what you're gonna see in the next few months. Uh, we believe the tool is now in a good place to answer what you will answer an analyst in your team. You can just like type the question, get an answer, amazing. If the data is not clean, you're gonna get garbage. So that's the frontier of cleaning the data, one. The other thing is we all have different terminology when, uh, uh, I'll just pick on some name, when Joe and Victor and Jason are saying OTP, OTD, or service level, they all mean something slightly different. So training the tool to really understand your context as an organization is something we are very focused on. And then the next frontier is what we discuss. It's not just giving you the questions, but giving you proactive recommendations on what to do. Again, back to Jason's question. You're still in charge, but can we start giving you suggestions? You'll have to evaluate. Uh, uh, we'll give you all the data and support why this suggestion makes sense with all the supporting data, but that's the next frontier moving from from supporting to predictive to proactive. And we're super excited about some of the early results that we are seeing on like, hey, what should I do about service? Well, we've analyzed and those are the 10 top things that we think are, are, are an issue on that lane or with that cost signee. And those are some things we can start doing about that. That's the next sort of frontier for us. The last thing I mentioned and a lot of requests we're getting is, hey, I want all of my other data there. I want my WMS. I want my ERP, I want my YMS. And we are starting to work about integrating more and more data stream beyond just the TMS data to equip and to provide better and better uh, outcomes from that. Um, Joe is asking about uh, how can how can CAI helping the Uber Freight operational team with interacting with their TMS system, Joe, great question. Everything that we showed here to you as a customer will also be available to our operational team. They're actually the beta customers of that. So we basically use AI to also uplift our operational team and allow them to be better and better and better. And they'll be the expert users. And if we will allow them to have access to the tool, and you can basically sort of ask them to use the tool on your behalf, but we'll definitely use that to up-level our internal teams, not just that, we'll use that to up-level our service teams, our support teams, basically everything across um, across the organization. Um, Anonymous is asking about the data, the data hygiene and prepare appropriately. What are the playbook for shippers to analyze and improve their data hygiene and prepare appropriately? Anonymous, I think that's a super important question. Uh, you need to have a data plan. <laughs> uh, you can have three answers to that. One, you have a team internally that can do that. Great. If not, two, you can use us. We have the team, we have the experts, we have an integration team. You can contact us, whether it's a free PL uh, relationship or four PL uh, relationship, we can either recommend you a plan or actually be the hands on the keyboard helping you implement the plan. And it doesn't have to be us. There's plenty of other providers, uh, 4PL uh, providers, 3PL providers that can help you on the journey. But Anonymous, back to your question, I couldn't emphasize more. Data is the enabler of that. So this is a calling cry to really sort of uh, um, get ready for what uh, what to come uh, after that. Um, 
lots of international questions. When is it in Canada? When is it in Mexico? We love uh, all the international um, uh, energy. We're going to start in the US. We want to get it right. Once we get it right, we're going to expand it to more domains and more geographies and more types of uh, systems. So stay tuned. But the initial focus is on uh, the US. And uh, with that, I think we are officially uh, over time. Um, we have a lot of great questions that I would be uh, happy to uh, um, follow up with everyone here offline. You can also just always just ping me at my uh, email. It's L-I-O-R-O-N, Lioron at uber.com. Happy to answer and take any questions there. Uh, and uh, check the URL, uberfreight.com solutions insights. AI. Uh, we are accepting now uh, initial customers. We have the team ready uh, to start working on the journey. And I really hope that all of us collectively, whether it's using Uber Freight or using some other platform or doing that in-house, can really leverage the huge opportunity we see artificial intelligence enabling us. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Excited for the dialogue and really appreciate the time you took from your busy day to learn about this important topic. Thanks, everyone.